In about 45 to 50 percent of the cases, an autopsy was not needed because the CT gave them the answer to the reason for the cause of death or the trauma or whatever the reason might be. Suicide, trauma, accident, you know, natural death, stuff like that. That has been a fascinating, fascinating uh, pathway that I have taken. And I've presented uh, at APM. I presented uh, because I want people to be aware of this. Welcome to Frame by Frame, Rethink Imaging, a podcast by Imalogix. Here, we explore the intricate world of medical imaging, aiming to dissect the field and inspire both professionals and curious minds alike. I'm your host, Chris St. John. Welcome back to Frame by Frame, Rethink Imaging. I'm your host, Chris St. John. What you're about to hear originally aired at the very end of our episode on the Dose Index Registry. It was part of a much broader conversation with Dr. Kalpana Kanal, but this section on postmortem CT and the emerging role of forensic imaging struck a chord. We heard back from a lot of you that it was one of the most thought-provoking parts of the episode, and we wanted to give it its own space for those who may have missed it the first time around. After playing such an integral role in DIR's early days, you have since stepped back from the initiative what kind of led to that decision and where are you focused now on your research and your professional? I got very fortunate to become a trustee, a diagnostic medical physics trustee for the American Board of Radiology. And I had to step back from the ACR because it was really difficult to manage both those leadership positions. The ABR trustee role is pretty demanding of time, uh, but it's a very fulfilling role as well. So I've been doing that since 2017. Uh, and that's why I stepped back from DIR. I mean, I'm still involved with uh, ACR. We're still trying to write some papers. I'm very much talked to all the leadership there now as well, but I'm not actively involved. Right now, my focus has been, in terms of work, has been on a very interesting new path that not a lot of people in physics are, which is forensic CT. So what that is, is basically using CT, so you're leveraging technology, to determine cause of death or trauma or whatever is going on in a cadaver. So instead of, imagine here, instead of doing an autopsy, if you could have that cadaver or that dead person go through a CT and you can figure out what is the cause of that um, and don't have to cut open the body, that is significant. So I've been working on this for the last six, seven years. So my chairman, Dr. Dushan Sahani, when he came to uh, University of Washington and he was talking about his, some, one of, some of his um, far-thinking ideas and his vision, this whole world of forensic CT totally resonated with me. And I just went with it that he gave me his blessing to move forward with it over here at University of Washington. So we started working on this. And we have, to today, we have uh, scanned about more than 150 cadavers on our semen CT scanner. You can do it on any CT. It's just that our Siemens CT scanner is right one floor over our medical examiner's office. And we have scanned um, 150, 160 of them. And um, in about 45 to 50 percent of the cases, an autopsy was not needed because the CT gave them the answer to the reason for the cause of death or the trauma or whatever the reason might be. And these are cadavers that come, decedents as well, it's called, uh, from suicide, trauma, accident, um, you know, natural death, stuff like that. That has been a fascinating, fascinating uh, pathway that I have taken. And I've presented uh, at APM, I presented uh, because I want people to be aware of this. In America, here in the U.S., not a lot of sites do this. But outside America, a lot of sites do it. Japan does it. Australia does it. There's England that does it. And why not here? I mean, just imagine the impact on community if you do not have to cut up a cadaver, right? Uh, think about the cultural and emotional sentiments that people have and saying, you know, my relative suffered enough and now you want to cut them open, right? I wouldn't want that for my relative. So I think it's going to have a far-reaching effect. We, we are publishing on it right now. It's in the process of being published. Um, I've given several talks at physicist meetings to bring awareness. And like the main common question I get is why not, right? Why aren't we doing it more? in the U.S. And I think it's an issue of billing and things like that for anything because radiologists have to read these images. We, we work with pathologists on doing this. So we have established this program here. 
And we did such a great job of convincing our medical examiner colleagues that uh, we helped them buy a CT scanner, which is going to be installed in the medical examiner's office in a couple of months. And then they're going to have every cadaver go through it. For my project, we did selective, right? Because we didn't have the bandwidth. But now imagine the whole new world opens up. The other reason this is, this is great using technology, but from an ME perspective, there's a shortage of forensic pathologists. So there aren't a lot of people available to do autopsies. They're backed up for days. So using technology to help, why not, right? So this is something I have been very interested in for the last four or five years, and that's what I've been working on to establish a forensic program here at University of Washington. Very, very interesting to me. Can I just ask? I'm I'm so curious. So, I mean, obviously, it's there's different cadavers coming in, and maybe you have clues of, like, when it comes to selecting protocols for these cadavers, is it always full body scans? Is it case by case? Like, I'm, I'm kind of just curious about how you approach this. We had the same questions when we got started. And I think we have now worked so much in it that it's getting more fine-tuned. The forensic pathologists who order these CTs from the medical examiner's office actually give us guidelines. They say, you know, we are interested in the pelvic area. So can you just run a pelvic CT? Or we are interested in chest, abdomen, pelvis. Or we are interested in, in the head. So now we are actually moving away from doing whole body. And that's actually good because a scanner, if you're doing whole body, you're heating up the scanner, you know, you're, you're creating tons of images, which no one is necessarily going to look at. Right. How, like, how many slices do you have to go through for a full body scan? A lot. So, you know, it also depends what slice thickness you're reading at. So we have now actually worked so well with our program and our medical examiner's office that now they give us guidelines. They say, okay, for this cadaver, you know, say it was a, medic, uh, a car accident. So it's an MVA. We suspect this trauma in this area. Can you do a CT here? Or we suspect this is going on. There's a lot of conversation going on between the forensic pathologists and our radiologists. They get some guidance. Um, and so we are now more focused in what we do. And we also actually do conferences every other month, I think it is, or every month. We're kind of like an M&M &M conference where we are looking at these cases and we are talking. It's so interesting because you're talking... The radiologist talking, hey, here is a finding on the CT. And then the forensic pathologist is putting their gory images with the blood and gore and anatomy, which now you're used to seeing and you're trying to correlate the two, right? which is so fantastic. So they learn a lot from our radiologists and our radiologists learn a lot from the forensic pathologists. What are their needs? What are they looking for? And I would say we are a good example of the success for someone who's trying to establish the program. As I said, there are other programs. Uh, one in Albuquerque, OMI at University of New Mexico is a very well-established program for years. They scan every cadaver that comes over there. You know, we are learning from other people, and I think we have been very successful in, in doing this, and I hope to, you know, see more happening in the future. And then you can apply this to education, right? Medical student education. You don't need to cut up bodies to look at anatomy. You can look at images, CT images, right? see what it looks like and things like that. So there's a limitless uh, potential for taking this to any other area you want to. I can't help but wonder, with you and your background in dose optimization, now working on forensic CT, your past experience with DIR now working in forensic CT, have you, like, did you have any observations about dose or image quality that you kind of picked up while working with cadavers? So the one thing is that dead people images look very different than live people, right? There's no blood flow. And the more further away from death you're imaging, it's going to look different. So I know that the dose is not a concern. They're dead, right? Yeah. So you're not worried about optimizing dose, but at the same time, you're not overexposing them either. We are um, really focused more on the radiologists and what image quality they want, right? So we really tweaked our uh, protocols because we use automatic tube current modulation and the radiologists have been happy with it. They haven't told us to tweak anything because again, it's hard for them anyway to look and relearn what anatomy looks like in a dead person because there's no blood flow and things like that. And that's what they are focused on. They're not focused on dose or anything. So that's not even come up. But we might do some projects with our residents in the near future to look at all the 150 patients we've done so far. What has been the dose? Curious, right? If there was a 300 pounder or a 100 pound patient, what is our range of doses for these cadavers? And 
is our radiologists who are reading this are so far seem to be okay with image quality. They haven't told us to increase the dose. It's a different question. The focus is more on, are we finding what we need to find with the physiological changes in cadavers because they're not alive more than worrying about dose. So the focus is a little different. Yeah, I, I wasn't thinking that you were focused on dose, but I was just curious about, yeah, like what your approach was when it came to image quality. Yeah, we took the same clinical protocol and we're using this. We probably tweaked up our dose a little bit because we, we were not worried about uh, harming anyone. So maybe 10, 20%, which is not significant. So we really haven't deep dived, if you will, into the dose aspect of these 150 or so we have done so far. But that is something we're looking, starting to look at now that our program is getting a little bit more established. We can now start looking at research projects along all these data that we have. I, that is way more interesting. I mean, it, not that it wouldn't be interesting, but you you had me just like sucked in for a minute. Yeah, it's been the response I've received at any audience. I've I've presented this to physicists. I've presented this to technologists. We have, we, our paper is getting published in JCAT. It should be coming out soon. I have had that response. This is so interesting. Why don't we do it? Well, yeah, why don't we do it, right, in the U.S.? So it's a question of billing and time and uh, uh, the radiologists getting compensated to read these images. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, wouldn't, I mean, someone performing an autopsy, there's billing and stuff involved in all of that as well. But yeah, no, it's, it's, it's fascinating to hear. And it just makes so much sense. Totally. That's what I'd say. <laughs> that is beyond fascinating. Dr. Canal, thank you so, so much for joining us today on Frame by Frame. It's been an absolute pleasure having you. Thank you so much, Chris. That was a lot of fun. Good. I didn't even realize that we have a formal podcast going on here. It was like a conversation, so I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Welcome to Frame by Frame, Rethink Imaging, a podcast by Imalogix. Here, we explore the intricate world of medical imaging, aiming to dissect the field and inspire both professionals and curious minds alike. I'm your host, Chris St. John.